Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. And we are talking today with a another author. We love talking with authors. And today we're talking with Rachel Fordham again. And Rachel, this is technically your fifth time on Hallmarkies podcast. Can you believe it? No, I can't believe it. But I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah, thank you so mm-hmm. much. Because you were on with the Deliver Me a podcast ladies three times. Yeah. And uh, so this is only your second time with me. Right. So <laughs> this is good. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, we're always so uh, grateful to have you on and you have a new book beyond Ivy walls and congratulations on the new book. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So for people that maybe have missed those other four previous appearances, uh, why don't you yeah introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. So, well, obviously I'm an author and I'm a mom. I always feel like that's my first thing mm-hmm. I have eight kids kind of, I have biological adopted and I still have one who's a foster child, but she's mine too. Cause I love her. Aww, love um, that. so that's like my, that's, that's the big chunk of my time. That's what I love. Um, uh-huh. but I live in Washington state. I live on an Island, but it has a bridge. So it's pretty normal. Um, I started writing t- about 10 years ago now, which is also kind of crazy. And mm-hmm. it all sort of started because, I was feeling like I needed a creative outlet. And my husband said, well, you read so much. Why don't you write a book? Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, let's do that. And it's just been this really, really fun. And I don't know. I don't even know the right words, but it's just been this whole other part of my life that I didn't know existed. And it's just been really great. And that's awesome. What (laughs) (laughs) What was your first book that you wrote? Um, well, the first book that I wrote was not published. So I wrote a book oh, okay. um, and it was actually took place. It was historical and took place in my home, like where I live now. And I loved it because I really got to dig into like the history of my own little community. Uh, but I realized that there's a lot of mechanics and things of writing that I still needed to continue to develop. And mm-hmm. so the next book I wrote uh, became The Hope of Azure Springs, which was my first release in uh, 2018. So how did you get that released? What I feel like that that first book's got to be the the hardest one to get those connections and yeah. So I'm kind of an outlier because I have a lot of writing friends who I totally love and respect, and they you know talk about trying to find an agent for years and going to conferences and pitching their stuff to people, and um, that was not my experience. Um, so you know I don't ever want to make anyone feel bad. My experience was definitely different. I wrote a book and I was like totally a newbie. I had no idea what I was doing. And I asked someone that I knew who had published and, but didn't know that I was writing. And I said, well, if someone wrote a book, what should they do next? And she just kind of casually said, oh, they should query an agent. And I said, okay. And then I went home and I had to Google, what does it mean to query an agent? (laughs) Because I had no idea. Yeah. And so I just, I think maybe because I had no idea, I also didn't realize that people like slay, spend so much time, like, you know, uh, going over and over and over their query letter, making sure it's perfect. So I started, I just wrote a letter that night. I was like, okay, I'll write a letter. And I got, grabbed some books off my shelf and looked at who in the thing, you know, the acknowledgements, the authors had thanked for, thanked as their agent. That's smart. And I just sent it to them. And the next morning I woke up and had a couple of requests for full manuscripts to read. And I ended up getting multiple offers for agents and then they kind of take it from there. You know, they kind of talk about where you would like your book to land, what you envision. And, and I mean, that whole process, you know, um, from actually signing with an agent and then them finding a publisher was a while. And I just kept writing during all of that. So actually when I got my first contract, they ended up buying multiple books. So that's really smart. That's a great (laughs) idea. Look at the acknowledgements. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. So that was kind of, so it was very backwards. You know, I had never been to a writing conference. I'd never done anything like that until after I was already published. Um, Uh uh, But I think for me, that was just, I don't know that I would have, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to like keep going for 10 years. Like some of my friends did. Like I didn't look at myself as an author. I had imposter syndrome, I guess. I was like, I don't know what Mm. I'm doing. Um, Yeah. That's a really good idea. That's smart. Well, (laughs) have you, have you always liked period pieces? Yeah. So, I mean, I think as I've always been drawn to like historical novels, historical movies, not to say that I don't appreciate the other, um, but I think it's sort of like, uh, like fun escapism. Like it's still so close to home that I can relate to it. 
but it's like, I get to jump into this other time period and kind of just let my imagination run with what it would have been like to be born then. Um, I do have a contemporary that's on submission, so we'll see on that one. So maybe next Yeah. time I'll be on, it'll be for that one. So you're a big Post Bulls fan, Saints Yes. Hill Delivered. What do you think of the new movie? Um, I really enjoyed it. I feel like, if I'm going to be totally honest, I liked it better than the one that was just before it. Uh huh. Um, I felt like... Um, I don't know. I guess it just, uh, I haven't thought through what I would say about this. Um, I, I mean, I love them all. I love the whole canon, but I really, it was fun to see them all again. It just kind of gives me all the happy feelings. I had to suspend reality sometimes about the ages of the characters and the ages of the actors and just Uh huh. go, Yeah. we love them. You know, if it was a brand new, like say it was a pilot, I think I would have been like, oh, this was cast wrong. They're too old. But because we've been with them for so many years, I was like, oh, I'm just so happy to see them all again. It gave me all the good Yeah. feelings. Um, I thought they did um, a great job with a lot of the different storylines. I have a lot of like respect for Martha, the writer. And I also like, man, it would be so hard to like have this project that you love and have actors that are aging and like figure out exactly what to do with it and don't never know exactly how many movies you're going to get in the future. And so I think she does for what she's got she's such an amazing job. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting because the two previous ones had felt like finales to the series. Cause And I think she has to keep writing. I'm like that. And that's, yeah, and that's I where mean, she had been told there's you have seven movies or something. there's goodbye toasts and and all this kind of stuff in both of them and and uh, I the I guess for me like I really did not think the Charlie plotline really made sense in the um, previous film I was just like there's no way that they would do this with something they just met and I don't know it just it just it just felt unbelievable to me And uh, so I was kind of hoping that they'd like sort of forget about that in the, but they sort of leaned into it <laughs> even more. And I was just kind of like, eh. but um, I mean, there's not a bad postables mo movie, but it, it probably would be one of my weaker ones for me because it, it just the letters I didn't think was that strong. And uh, I don't know, but there was definitely cute moments between Shane and Oliver. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would say I liked it better than the previous one I had. And I think maybe being an, like an adoptive mom and stuff, I kind of struggled a little bit with that storyline in the last one. It felt like it was Mm -hmm. yeah kind of underdeveloped and it almost felt like, why did we go here? So I was glad yeah that we got more of that, that we got to see that this journey was a little bit more complicated and stuff for Rita and Norman and yeah you could tell that there's another movie coming because to me it did feel a little filler like yeah. this is in in between then this And next I also, one you know, as, as a writer myself, like, obviously it is Martha's baby, but it's like really easy for my mind to like start spinning with what I would have done or what I, what I think they could do in the future. So that's, but I, I kind of enjoy doing that with movies anyway, but there's Yeah. definitely like, I don't know, but no, I, I still really enjoyed it and it just kind of was nostalgic too. So it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ho, ho, ho. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Patreon. Do you love Hallmarkies podcasts, especially at Christmas? Do you enjoy the holiday previews, recaps, interviews, and bonus episodes? If the answer is yes, please consider supporting the Hallmarkies Patreon. We need your help to do what we do both during the Christmas season and all year round. But not only do you help a podcast led by strong, independent women by becoming a Patreon, you get to become a part of the Hallmarkies family. Starting at only $2 a month as a patron, you will have access to our Facebook Patreon group where we talk about the movies, shows, and more all year. We also have many monthly patron watch-alongs with guests like Lacey Chabert, Natalie Hall, Paul Campbell, Mary Lou Henner, and more, giving their behind-the-scenes details of their films. As a patron, you also have the chance to provide input into the podcast and even join us at different tiers. So this Christmas season, spread some cheer to the Hallmarkies Patreon and become a member today. You won't regret it. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies to learn more. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. Oh, so last year you had the letter tree Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this new book has sort of an epistolatory element. There's some letter writing going on. And so is that something that you particularly uh, are drawn to? 
Um, I don't ever really go in, well, the letter tree, I guess I did go in knowing that I was going to utilize letters, but like this one, I didn't go into it like thinking, oh, I'm going to weave letters into the story. Like that wasn't part of what I knew ahead of time. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it ends up sometimes allowing characters to speak in a little bit different way than they would face to face. And with these characters who have, you know, like it's almost easier, especially for our main male character to communicate in that way, um, just because of his own insecurities and trauma mm -hmm. that he's been through. And so it ended up being fun, but it is also, it, you know, sometimes I feel like, oh, the postables will love this. This is a little nod to some of that too. And so, mm. but it, it was not my intention going in. It just sort of worked that way. On yeah. This one. yeah. I was going to ask, what do you think special about letter writing? I just think that, um, well, I mean, I, I guess it's a little bit different in every book, but okay, back up. So I think that like when, <laughs> I think that even if you think of like all, all your movies and stuff that you review, like the ones that sometimes I think have a broader appeal, like more people love them, they utilize like more love languages, right? So it speaks to more people to like how they understand love. And so I think that like sometimes throwing in a letter just is extra fun because um, it's like another, it's like a gift kind of, or it's, um, and so I think it kind mm -hmm. of fills that, Yeah. The, you know, people who are like, oh, he slid that under her door. That's so sweet. Um, so it kind of touches that base, but it, it also allows for like a little bit different communication for in this, in this story, you know, like Otis, uh, he almost gets to jump into a different personality when he's writing these letters and you get to see a side of him that he's not ready to kind of reveal in person he's kind of our you know he's kind of the beast in that beauty and the beast storyline and i think he gets yeah. to like leave that leave that part of himself behind when he's writing a little bit so well, there's something so intentional about writing a letter and yeah. that you're really like it's supposed to when you're talking you're just you know kind of saying what you think yeah, like i'm doing right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> whereas when you're writing a letter you you have to kind of there's like another step in there in, in processing thoughts, you know, exactly. which I think makes it, I mean, that's why Jane Austen was the qu queen of, of uh, um, letters yeah, or letter yeah. writing in her, you know, especially her, her dudes. Nobody could write a letter like a Jane Austen dude. <laughs> I know. Right. So no, I agree. And it's just, and we all want someone to write us that letter. So, yeah. <laughs> so when I get to write them in the books, it's fun. I'm part agony, part hope. That's where, that's where I was going. Persuasion, yeah. right? Is that is the persuasion? Persuasion, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, Darcy in his famous letter. Right. <laughs> oh, it's fun to get to utilize. You, you know, you get to. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. So, uh, how did you get the inspiration? Well, actually, before we said, so we beyond Ivy Walls. Why don't you tell the tell the um, listeners a little bit about it? What it okay. was about. So it's kind of a little bit of a Beauty and the Beast meets, I don't know, The Light Between Oceans. I don't know if everyone knows that reference, but, um, and it's got a little Jane Eyre and a little, little women. I don't know. It's kind of uh -huh. big, big uh -huh. mashup there, but, <laughs> um, so my main character Otis has kind of been exiled from his community like years and years ago, but the community is under the impression that he is a famous musician and they're always anticipating his return home. Uh, Sadie ha is from the rural area and her father like ends up injured. And so she goes to town to, to work and make money to send back to her family. And she ends up not having any place to stay. So she ends up kind of squatting on in an abandoned building, which when he returns home, their paths cross, but he doesn't want anyone to know that he's returned home because he has a lot of baggage. And so kind of in that beauty and the beast sort of theme, he ends up hiring her as long as she doesn't tell people that he's returned to the community. And that's mm -hmm. sort of the catalyst for, you know, the story as they, their lives are thrown together and they, you know, both have these things that they need to work through. And I think it's, I think it's super romantic and has a little bit of that forced proximity, a little bit of healing i don't know there's some funny moments i think i don't know i had a really good time writing this one but ultimately yeah. it's a happily ever after story i said beauty and the beast meets jane Eyre. oh there you go yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Which, which i'm totally fine with because i love jane Eyre. i know some people mm -hmm. some people don't but i do too mm -hmm. i do too yeah i the just sort of i mean, you've got your sort of brooding hero who's shut away from mm -hmm. the world and you've got you know sadie definitely has some bell vibes but like there's there's also like 
a li- some darker moments like with Jane. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just I think it's a good balance of the two. Yeah, I really and I really enjoyed kind of not um I, I mean some people won't even pick up on that. Like it's not pulled so much from those no, no. days that it's that it's it's not necessarily a retelling, but it's got a, it's got some of those feelings, which I think I mean every he's Otis is definitely like the underdog that you want to root for. And then suddenly you're like, how did I go from not understanding this guy to kind of like finding him kind of swoony and really loving him? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. An yeah. unexpected hero there. So. so how did you get the inspiration for, for this book? Yeah. So this one, um, so it was actually written before the letter tree. And so oh, okay. the five novels that took place before I wrote this one took place in like the late 1800s and in like rural communities. And so I, I thought it would be fun to do kind of throwbacks to some of those books. And so I wanted to stay in that kind of setting. And, but I didn't want it to be like a, like a prairie farm book. And so I was like, well, what's a, what's the way that I could stay in that area and still, um, but have it feel fresh. So I was kind of researching like factories and things like that. Cause I was like, well, I haven't really done that type of setting yet. And I came across the Hoig feather duster factory, which is a real feather duster factory. And that was sort of the catalyst. I was like, Oh, that would be like a different and sort of intriguing setting um, to throw my character into. And so I went to the old newspapers there and started reading, trying to find more information on this Hoig feather duster factory. And I ended up, and that's where I came across, like, as I was reading all these old newspapers, like how, like kind of the phenomenon of like roller skating in that era and like all these advertisements for like miracle cures. And so I started pulling elements from the newspaper that were just going to like be pieces of the story. Um, and then I reached out to the library and said, I, I read all like your old newspaper, but I'm still like, I still have questions about the Hoig feather duster factory. I envisioned it being a bigger part of the story. And they said, oh, we can connect you with the descendants of that factory. (laughs) And so that was really, really fun. And I ended up talking to them. And and so anyways, so that was kind of the starting place. And then it was just sort of like, what brings her to town? (laughs) You know, it was just sort of filling in the holes. Um, But that was that was the jumping off point of where it was going to take place and stuff like that. So did it kind of evolved as a story or did you have it kind of laid out? Um, when I went into it, I knew like I wanted, I wanted to use, I knew my setting. Um, I knew that I wanted obviously to, to get to a happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of the pieces, I really went in blind on this one and got to kind of discovery, right. Which was really fun. And then, especially when you discovery, right. And you realize that you're on a good track, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, sometimes you start writing and you're like, Whoa, how did I, I went off on a tangent. (laughs) Um, yeah. But it, it, um, I did not know a ton going into it. Um, and it just sort of wrote itself, which is funny because I didn't even really pick up on the fact that it had a beauty and the beast vibe until like partway into the writing. And I was like, mm-hmm. Oh, this, this is sort of mirroring this story that I've yeah. always loved. So. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's factor meals. Warmer, sunnier days are calling. Fuel up for them with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals in time for summer thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you'll always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. Make today the day you kickstart a new healthy routine. What are you waiting for? With 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week, you'll always have new flavors to explore. Crush your wellness goals this month with dietitian approved meals and ingredients you can trust. Make your day delicious from breakfast to dessert. Stay fueled with easy nutritious options. Treat yourself to restaurant quality meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, and blackened salmon. Keep kitchen time to a minimum. Factory meals are ready in two minutes. No shopping, prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Enjoy effortless support for your lifestyle. Choose from six menu preferences to help you manage calories, maximize protein intake, avoid meat, or simply eat well balanced. Head to factormeals.com slash hallmarkies50 and use code hallmarkies50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code hallmarkies50 at factormeals.com slash hallmarkies50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. Definitely check out Factor Meals. We know you'll love them. So are you usually working on multiple books at the same time? 
Um, yeah. So like, well, at least in a way like this book. Um, so it's like being marketed and then it'll be at the same time that I'm editing one. And then at the same time that I'm trying to write a new one, you know, and so there's always like, you know, this one's tricky because I wrote it before the letter tree. So now it's, so I wrote it and then now I'm, I'm like a couple, it's a couple books back and now I'm, you know, it's, it's in its marketing phase, but that's just part of the fun. It lets me go revisit these characters that I, I really did fall in love with while I was writing them. Was it tricky writing those characters and like making them palatable for a modern palette, but like not too modern, finding that balance? Yeah. Um, I think that like, um, I feel like Otis was easy for me to write. And I think that's because he has so much like natural, like this because of his backstory, like he just comes into the story with so much, I don't want to say baggage, but like, there's just so much to work with. Like it's because obviously when you start a, a, a book, you want growth, like you want your characters to grow. And so he came into it from a place where there was just so much room for him to grow and to heal. So he was not hard for me to write. It was a little bit tricky because he has like, um, he deals with like a physical um, disease, I guess. And, and then obviously scars as well. And so I couldn't use the terminology for it because it didn't exist. And so mm -hmm. like that part was a little bit tricky um, to try to try to reveal what he, what he was actually dealing with. Um, but for her, she was a lot harder for me to write. Like she's the one that I went back and forth with the editors of like, what is her motivation? Um, is she likable? Is she interesting enough? Um, and it was tricky because I really, really wanted her to come from like a good family Because so many, like, if you really start thinking about it, so many books, like, they're an orphan or they're, um, you know, they're, their dad's trying to control their lives or something like that. And I just wanted her to come from, like, a healthy family. And so you don't come in with as much, um, as much baggage to deal with. And it's, I mean, it's really easy to write an interesting character when they've had a whole lot of, like, stuff thrown at them in their life. So right. it's harder to write. But as far as, like, making it relevant to modern readers like that's I feel like that's one of my strength strengths because I think I really get that like whether you lived in 1903 1920 like feelings and emotions really are universal and so it's just um changing the backdrop and stuff for that yeah yeah well yeah I mean I just think it would be hard because you don't want the character to be uh a, like a doormat obviously but like you also don't want her to be like A girl boss like you want to find like that like that middle ground you know especially that it would be a period accurate kind yeah. of type of independence right no and that that is in this book maybe not as challenging as some of the other ones and I although there will be people who will say you know oh well they um I don't know not necessarily with this book so much but you'll get I get feedback sometimes where people will say oh nobody you know, like the, your characters just kind of broke like society's rules. Like, I can't believe this book. It's not believable, but someone told me a long time ago and it really struck me and, and you'll appreciate this with your Jane Austen reference, but um, anytime there's been rules in society, people have been breaking them. Right. So this idea that like men and women, like weren't supposed to be alone together, that may have been like the ideal and what was being taught, but we know that people were breaking that all the time. Yeah, I mean, true. you look at J every Jane Austen and there's a character who's doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. Right. Like, right, yeah. And That's so, true. I mean, it's, so if it happened even once, then it, it is historic, it can be historically accurate. And so, I mean, yeah. actually random fact for your Hallmarkies podcast, there were um, doctors and stuff who would teach that, like you, that first babies were born early <laughs> because So many women were pregnant when they got married real quickly, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, obviously that's not even a part of this book, but like that just, it just goes with this idea. Yeah. Like, in, um, in the, in the Bridgerton book, that's that they just did this last series off the mm -hmm. romancy, Mr. Bridgerton, uh, he talks about there's, there's a whole part where Colin's like, I, I knew a lot I know about a lot of eight month babies <laughs> yeah like it was just kind of a thing There were a lot. Yeah, <laughs> that is not yeah. what this book is about but like <laughs> it just reminds me that like you know so like I think that part of the problem sometimes is that you have a modern reader who's thinking like well they were all living this way you know and so it's sometimes you have to push yeah. a little bit against your reader 
and say, well, that's may have been what their parents were teaching them. That's not necessarily what was happening, you know? And so in this case, you've got this girl Yeah. who's squatting on someone's property and she doesn't want her parents to know because she knows they wouldn't like that, but they also need money. And so, you know, she's breaking some of those society rules a little bit, but not necessarily doing something that people wouldn't have done either. I think the key is, is that you want the character to feel authentic to the, to the time period, you know, you like, if it's like, yes, you want them to be a free spirit, but you want it to feel like, okay, this is a free spirit in Victorian times, you know, like it just has to sort of feel grounded. yeah I think so too and I And think I think you did. and I think trying to put like I always try to put like a note in the end and kind of say what's real and what's not if I can and like in this one um so I ended up that we made it take place in 1903 but originally it was written in like the 1880s and one of the things that was interesting was I would tell people that I was going to throw roller skating into the storyline because I just it was such a big deal like they everybody loved it And I thought that would be like kind of make some fun settings rather than just always doing a dance and a story. I was like, we can still have some of that physical touch and stuff with them roller skating and it'll be a little bit different. Yeah. But people are like, people didn't roller skate in the 1800s. They were all like pioneers with bonnets on. And, you know, and so it's it's fun to challenge that a little bit because I know that when they go and Google it, they'll be like, oh, that really did happen. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, so, absolutely. so it's it's fun to push that a little bit sometimes, Plus, but like as long the as it's accurate. the pioneers things, that's like eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties. Well, yeah. And, and then that's obviously like moving West, right? So some of these more developed, you know, places are going to have a lot different, but it, people get just one image for like an Yeah. entire century in their head. And it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, that is good. And uh, so you have this whole element, and I won't give any spoilers, but you have this whole element with his niece, uh, Elizabeth or Bessie. Um, was it, with again, without giving it away, was it hard to decide what to do with that element and how to end it and Mm -hmm. where, Um, no, where to do it? that was Okay. not hard for me only because, um, so I told you earlier, like I'm a foster parent. I have an adopted child from foster care too. Anyway, um, Having been in this system, like I have seen really, really beautiful, like reunifications. I've seen really beautiful um, adoptions. And I've also seen like really like heartbreaking times where I feel like people did what was easier or what like the adult wanted and they've sort of forgotten about the child. And so I really like in a lot of my books without meaning to, there'll be like a kid in need or something. And so in this case, I was like, I don't want to write I don't want to give it away either, but I was like, I want to challenge the reader to think about what is the right thing for the kid, even if that's hard to do, you know, like, even if it's hard for the rest of us, because I think that that is what we should always do. And that will look different in every case, but like putting the kid first and even if it like is painful. And so, and so I knew going in that that was what I wanted to write, keeping it a secret and figuring out how to reveal some of that was more complicated because I wanted, I was like, do I hold on to it? Do I get it? Like, at what point do we let people know what's going on here? But, but I'm happy with how it ended. I Mm think, -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good. I I liked think it's it too. satisfying. Um, and I think that it hopefully will lead people. It's not like this isn't a book with a like deep, deep message. It's obviously a, like, sigh worthy happily ever after is what it's ultimately we want it to be but I would love it if people walked away and thought wow like what's the right thing in this situation regardless of what like anyone else expects of me or what I want just what's the right thing Mm -hmm. yeah I mean that definitely should especially when dealing with children that should be the goal mm-hmm is uh in what's what's actually going to make them the most happy and I I always feel like I mean unless somebody is like truly toxic like for the most part kids can use as much love in their life as possible. Like there's Oh, never too much love. I would definitely agree with that. And I think that that, I mean, that's a journey I had to go on. I think, you know, was you know, like with some of my foster kids was realizing that like, if they're loved, right. Like you don't have to kick people out to let more people in your heart just grow Yeah. with more people. Right. But I, th I think that, I mean, there was a little bit of wrestle with that. I think at different points for, for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this feather duster factory, so you were, you were just researching and you stumbled upon it. 
Yeah. And then I was like, oh, that's kind of a fun setting. And I'm actually, I don't know when this, I don't know when this is coming out on your podcast, but I'm going to Iowa and I decided, you know what, right after my book launch, I'm going to go to the Monticello and I'm going Uh-huh. to, I'm going to do my little book launch from there Oh, that's because fun. all these, you know, these sweet people that are so excited to have their community in the book and who sent me like pictures of the original Aw, feather dusters and explained that's to cool. me how they were made. I was like, I think that's where I want to go this time. So. It kind of reminded me of one of my favorite books is North and South. <gasps> yes, we read Elizabeth the same Gass. stuff. Oh, yeah, we do. That's It's the one same. of my favorites. And uh, I think it's a perfect novel. And uh, and the adaptation is really good, the BBC. Um, and the the uh, the way in that adaptation, the way the Marbury Mills is portrayed with the, the uh, it's you know, got sort of the, the cotton it's almost has a feathery kind of Uh, right you know look the right way they do it it's, oh it's yeah so good i just seemed like plus i was like if i wanted to like kind of have her be at a really low point which is kind of where you want to start a book um i'm like what's grosser than just being covered in turkey dander when you're and you have no place to be yeah <laughs> it's yeah just kind of that's like a good low place to start yeah <laughs> right like um plus i think it shows i mean she's willing to do it for her family right um But yeah, that was, I thought that was really fun. I'm excited. Um, the actual building doesn't exist anymore. It, there's an image of it in the back of the finished copy of the book, though. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, but I guess there's a, um, like, I, I'm not sure exactly. I believe it's like a senior living facility there now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they were like, when I was telling them that I was going to come, they're like, will you come and like, just like, come and meet the people who live there? I was like, sure, that would be fun. So Oh yeah, that yeah, would be it'd good. be, it'd be really cool. That'd be really fun. Uh, yeah, I think it's like the the craziest thing that the, as much as I love that BBC North and South, like I think it's kind of nuts that that's the only version of that story. I mean, I think there was another BBC one in like the seventies, but like there's never been a feature film. I, it's just boggles my mind. How many? versions of Jane Eyre have we gotten over the years and Wuthering Heights and you know it's like you just think that there would be Yeah, there's I can. it's so crazy to me I mean, they like did do a really, really good job with it they originally, did but I mean, there's still like a new generation that would yeah be exposed to it because it's yeah it's really it's really good. Although, could you beat Richard Armitage? Is that am I saying that right? yeah Adam I Wharton. it, it'd be tough but Yeah. I I mean, I don't know. It's just, I guess it's surprising to me that nobody has even tried, you know, like it's just bonkers to me, Yeah, but I mean, they could do a shorter length one, and I think you could probably do pretty well with it, too. yeah. You just have to, like, leave out some of the, like, secondary subplots. Yeah. Kind of Some thing. of the union stuff and things. I think it would, it would be, it would be so good, but someday maybe, but, I love it. uh, So you said in the afterward that you had, uh, your son had alopecia Um, and that so, was. yeah, I mean, it was like, so I guess there's like different types. There's like kind of like the splotchy type. Um, that's not the actual term for it. So I apologize. Um, and then there's, you know, obviously like my main character, like they didn't have the term alopecia, but like Otis has like the universal or universalist or whatever it's called, where it's like all hair and it, it doesn't come back in the case of my son. It was long before I wrote this book. Um, we were just like, why do you always have like, he had like a bald spot, like right here. And he was like 10, 12, something like that. And like, we took him to like the doctor and I was just like, is his hair falling out? You know? And so he was like, oh, it's probably this and let's just watch it for a while. And so it was about like a year, maybe a year and a half. And then it grew back for him. I have no idea why, but, but it sort of made me dig into it. And just like, I was like, became really aware of the disease. And so then when I was trying to think like, what would be believable for Otis, that was just a really kind of like, good, like, a, I don't know, it was just the material I needed to go and like, I was like, well, let's research this, what was it like in this time period, and then to find out that there were some like, superstitions about it, and people who kind of saw it real negatively. And so I was like, well, That works. We're going to use that. And, and plus it's fun to get to represent something and show that like, um, that, I mean, well, I don't even think that we would look down on it now, but just to, people can put themselves in the, his shoes if they've got anything that sets them apart a little bit and realize that it's just a piece of us, not all of us. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you also said in the afterward that you said, uh, I enjoyed writing a loving functional family that supported one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this was Sadie and her sisters. Uh, what drew you to doing that and telling that story? And, and is, uh, is, I guess, is it harder to, to write? Yeah. A functioning um, I, family? Do, <laughs> I do think it's harder because um, I think there's a reason why when you, you know, even watch like old Disney cartoons or something, yeah. why there's so Gotta much kill the mother or like the evil stepmother or the, yeah. I'm an orphan. Um, because it's just, it just makes, it kind of makes it easier in a lot of ways for mm-hmm. one thing we can kind of isolate them from their family. If they don't have a support system, then you're looking for something you've got natural kind of like holes in your life. So that was harder, but at the same time, I think like, you know, we need more good examples of like good families out there. And so it was really fun. I mean, I would love to write like the other sisters someday if I ever have time, but mm-hmm. um, I think it just, it just was important to me because my, like, I think I have a really beautiful home life and I grew up in a beautiful home life. And um, I think that in some ways like that should be represented too. And that there's still, there's still a lot of interesting things that can happen to people that outside of like just yeah. families. So and plus Otis needed to see that because he didn't really get that. And so it created a good contrast. Like they both kind of have things that the other doesn't. You know, he has money, he has um a home, those kind of things. And then she's got she has the family and and those things. So yeah, just because you have a happy marriage or a happy family life doesn't mean you have no conflict. Right. You just have to be more still creative with your conflict, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So you have Sadie being this basically the squatter. Mm-hmm. How did you come up with that? And what was that like to kind of write? So in my very first draft, it kind of starts with her, like, because she, when she goes to town, she's at like a boarding house or she's not a boarding house. She's like renting a room from someone. Mm-hmm. And, and then she, they end up kind of coming to her and saying, oh, like this person's going to pay more and they kick her out. And so I kind of started like writing all of that out. And then in the final draft, I was like, I'm just going to start with her like already um, kind of homeless. And so I think that like, I think I needed to like walk through the early days of um, factory life with her, but I don't think the reader really needed it. And so I cut it, but it helped me to just kind of know, like she came to town with the intention of, like she had a plan. She wasn't just like, I'm going to show up in town and do, and just, you know, make it on my yeah. own. But then it just sort of worked out really well. Cause I knew I needed to create that forced par- proximity. I needed to throw them into each other's lives. And so it was just a matter of getting them there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really worked for the story because it also it puts her at an even like, like more of a disadvantage. Like I said, you, you got to start from a place where there's room to grow. Mm-hmm. And so she's in a, she's in a jam, like where, Cause why else would she work for him and agree to work for him if she didn't like desperately need a place to stay desperately? I mean, it's kind of your beauty and the beast moment where she's like, Belle's like, I'll take my father's spot. You know what I mean? So she's going, I'll do this for my family. Like I'll work for this grouchy guy. Mm-hmm. Um, We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies merch store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable hardy or Hallmarky in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. Like, it was it all that forced proximity? Was it all like pandemic inspired at all? Well, yeah. there's there's one joking reference to the pandemic where she's uh-huh. dusting and she makes a joke about... Um, how she doesn't get a sneezy if she covers her face and oh what if what if everybody I don't know it's kind of just yeah. a joke. <laughs> um not necessarily I I mean I did originally I was gonna not have like the um the older couple like the housekeepers I wasn't gonna have them there 
And then I was like, mm, people are going to have a hard time with that. Like, they're going to feel like this is uncomfortable. And so I was like, I'll put the older couple housekeepers living there too. Just, just, and that was, I guess, thinking of like the modern sensibilities, I guess, but mm -hmm. um, I can't, I forgot what your question yeah. <laughs> no, just I was just that about the pandemic. No, you answered yeah. it well. Um, so what would you say is like special about this book? What do you, what would be your pitch to somebody? Check it out. They'll they'll like it. Mm -hmm. I'm like really bad at those, so it's not gonna sound good, but um <laughs> I think that people who obviously like happily ever afters will like this book. Um I would say happily ever afters that are not it's not pure fluff, like that has a little bit of depth, but there's like there's lots of humor. Um, they are, they are every review I've gotten, including the professional ones, like mentioned that like, this is a couple that you want to root for. Like you yeah. want to see them get together. You want, you like both of these characters and you want them to, you want to watch it happen and you want it to work out. Um, and so I think that that's something that will touch people's hearts and make them kind of feel swept away by this story um it has a kind of a fairy tale feel without obviously being a fairy tale at all but just sort of a rags to riches and that kind of thing um, yeah, yeah well, it's just a very like endearing character with otis because he uh you just he's very wounded yeah yeah, yeah. And, and very like innocently wounded like sometimes you write there's a grumpy character which we all kind of enjoy a grumpy character now and then but you're like, why are you so grumpy? And I think yeah. in this one, you just really feel like I get it. Like I get why you're so like why life's been so hard to you. And yeah. I want you to be happy, which I just, so I do think they're characters people are going to root for. Another thing that has come up a lot is um, you'll know this reference. So um, several people have said it has a hand flex moment and they're referring uh -huh. to, to pride and yeah. prejudice uh -huh. where it's like, he like uh Mr. Darcy's walking away. It's in the yeah, yeah. version, which is not my favorite version, but it's, it's still got its place. I, but I still enjoy it. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. he's walking away and like he has like hand flexes as he's walking away. And you just feel like that m movement like captures yeah. this, like chemistry and romantic tension. And so I think that that's something I love that people are saying that because I think that you really feel that like. There's these moments where there's this like, will they, won't they? I don't know if I'm explaining it well, mm -hmm. but they just yeah. they give you the butterflies and you're like, oh, like, I just want you to come together. You guys are going to love each other. I don't know. So yeah, no, apparently it has hand flex moments. So yeah. <laughs> good. that's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we like to end with our fun get to know you questions. Last okay. time we did the Christmas questions. Now we have the regular questions. Okay. So first question is what is the best ice cream flavor? I feel like anything I'm with like, like peanut butter involved in it somehow. Yeah. It's a good choice. Okay. What's your favorite color? Uh, red. Okay. Good. What uh, music are you into? Well, I, this is longer than a short one. I like everything, but my kids worked at this like, um, fish packing plant for a little bit oh, okay. and they had country music blaring all the time. And that is what they have on all the time. And I love anything that like, where you want to grab a like spatula and like sing around in the kitchen. And so right now it's country because that's oh, what they know. Good. Okay, good. Uh, what is your go-to date night food? Mm -hmm. Well, so if we were going to go out in our local town, we would go to Fiesta Jalisco. Um, because they have the best chips and salsa. Oh, that's our go-to mm -hmm. local. We could go further, but so Mexican food, I guess. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Kind of... What would you say is your go-to date night activity? If you're going out doing something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my husband loves to disc golf. That's what it's called. Yeah. And so I go with him sometimes. That's his... like mini golf. No, it's like with Frisbees and you like go to the back. Oh Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, okay, he, okay, I, yeah. he loves that. I'm not as good at it, but I enjoy it. Um, my preference is something like interactive like that, but I'll, I'll never pass up just going to the movies either. So mm -hmm. cool. Uh, would she like better dogs or cats? Cats. Okay. Uh, would she like, would she like better beaches or mountains? Hmm beaches mm -hmm. okay sorry that was a tough one no it's uh yeah. what's your favorite holiday to celebrate christmas mm -hmm. it's hard to be at christmas because it's like a whole season as opposed yeah. to just one day you know yeah. 
Uh, okay. Okay. What is your favorite Hallmark or romantic movie? Well, I am a I am a post so I'm gonna yeah, go with yeah, post yeah. and I'm I think that probably Rita and Norman's wedding, maybe. Okay. It, it was yeah. really I forget what, was, what that one was called. That was that was the first what the we first thought was finale. a series finale, yeah. and then we got another series finale, and now we're getting two more. Right. Yeah, yeah, that one was really good. Oliver with the green tie and, and everything. And that was yeah. really fun. It just had like, it had like the happy, really happy ending. I feel like, okay, we can, we won't go into that. We could talk about yeah. more, but yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that's a good choice. I mean, the sign still delivered. I My favorite is the for Christmas is my oh, favorite. Yeah. I think it's one of the best Christmas movies Hallmark's ever made. One, just one of the best movies they've ever made. I think it. It's actually, and it's actually about Christmas. Yes. Like, no, I love it. The, the, there are very few. I mean, I love, obviously, I love the sweet mm-hmm. rom coms, obviously, but like, they're not really about Christmas. Right. Whereas, I like, this is actually about. That one was really perfect. And you got to see, I mean, there was like, their stories are moving along. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that was, was really beautiful. Really, yeah, really, that really good. Yeah. Well, very good. You did it. Answered all the questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for having me again. It was so fun to get to talk with you. We'll have a link, our uh, affiliate link in the description. Y'all can check out the book. I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you so much for talking with us and congrats on, on writing another book. It's such an accomplishment. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if people want to follow you on like social media or anything like that, do you have anything? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, Rachel underscore Fordham. I'm on um, uh, Facebook and I have a website, rachelfordmer.com. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We'll have all that in the description. And if you're listening, let us know what you think about all the things we talked about. And if you get to read the book, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And uh, you can find me at Rachel's Reviews all over social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Goodreads. So check that out. And uh, follow the podcast, Hallmarkies Pod, Hallmarkies Podcast, all over social media. And if you are listening on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. We really appreciate that. And if you are watching on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We appreciate that so much. We also have our patron group and merch store. And we appreciate that support so much. And uh, thanks again, Rachel. And we'll talk to y'all later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.